If you're in here with us this morning for God's Word, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning for a standalone message uh, this morning. To be honest with you, this is mostly a message that's on my heart this week about how we spend our time. And so we're going to take just a a quick week off. We're in a four-week series called Rooted, if you've not been with us, and we will finish that up next week as we begin to head toward Christmas. But this week, the Lord laid something on my heart, and it's been there. I couldn't get it to go away, and so this is just where we're going to go with it this morning. Y'all good with that? Y'all good with that this morning? So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. I think to be honest with you, that we particularly need the message that is found in these awesome verses this morning. We, I I believe we really need to hear this. I think as we have celebrated Thanksgiving, it's a perfect time for us to have this reminder that the Scripture is going to give us today. And here's my heart on this. I believe every time that we read God's Word that it impacts us. I truly believe what the Scripture says, that that Word never goes out void. Are you all with me on that? I mean, the Word never goes out void. So as we get to Ephesians 5, I realize I'm grabbing something out of the middle of a book. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul has been talking to the church in Ephesus about about unity in the body of Christ. If you're to read all of Ephesians and you get to Ephesians 5, right before that, he's talking to to them about unity in the body of Christ. He's talking to them about how we as believers are to have a spirit of love among one another, how we're to show the love of Christ in our relationships with one another. In fact, he gets real practical right before he gets to chapter 5, and there's a lot about Christian living. If you're a Christian, then you, you ought to be living like this. You see a lot of that in Ephesians chapter 4 and even in the first parts of Ephesians chapter 5. So with that in mind, we get to these two verses, verses 15 and 16, and Paul says, this is some of the most familiar scripture in the New Testament, especially among, in Paul's writing. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Pretty, pretty simple, straightforward scripture. My heart and mind this week kept going to this particular thought pattern, as, as this scripture has been on my heart as I looked at these verses. And the thought that kept coming to my mind when I look at this scripture is the realization of how so many things have been normalized in our society. And in fact, last week I talked about that just a little bit when we were talking, actually the last two weeks, when we were talking about marriage last week and we were talking about parenting the week before. Remember, we talked a little bit about how our society has normalized things that the Scripture never said were supposed to be normal for us. The problem, honestly, is what has become the norm for so many people. How... It's even how it's so different in a modern world as compared to what it was like in the day that Paul wrote this scripture. And the reality is, go with me here for just a second, we live in a society where sin has been normalized. We've talked about that a lot lately, where right is made to be wrong, and wrong is portrayed and believed to be right by so many people. I read an article this week that talked about that, and I want you to listen to this short excerpt about the normalization of sin. Listen to this. It begins by asking the question, how does sin become normalized? Here's how. Spiritual sickness is presented to people as a good thing, as something that should be accepted or maybe even sometimes admired. Spiritual sickness is presented as courageous, as a core truth that Christianity has cruelly suppressed. In other words, our society says that Christianity has, that the purpose for Christianity is to suppress the society. Spiritual sickness is then rebranded as freedom. As born again believers, however, we know that true freedom can only be found in wholehearted submission to Christ. But the new, in the new normal of sin, submission to God is equated to slavery. You can't be free and a slave at the same time. So obviously, in our world, this thought is being pushed that we need to free ourselves from God. And the fastest way to do that is to throw off everything that is condoned by God. 
where once, and some examples of this in this article are this, where once there was marriage as God invented it, like we talked about last week. Now there are multiple views on what people think is okay. Where once children were viewed as a creation of God in the womb, now abortion is supposed to be a right. It's just a couple of examples, and the list goes on. The normalization of sin wasn't imposed, listen to this, it wasn't imposed on Christendom. It was presented as a temptation, just as sin was presented as a temptation to Adam and Eve. No one can be forced to sin or to accept sin as normal. It's a decision of the will. Sin is always a choice that's made knowing it's wrong, but choosing it anyway, trying to justify it with what appears to be reasoned excuses. When we accept sin as the norm, this article says, we suffer exile from all that's good and holy while we wallow in that which is rancid and evil until it coats and penetrates and is absorbed so deeply into our being that we can no longer tell the difference between right and wrong, between what is sin and what is not sin because there is seemingly no difference. And I'm just telling you, I'm here to tell you this morning, that's the society we live in. When it gets to that point on the societal level, Sin has been normalized. So we're at that point. And reality is this morning, what is normal to many is not normal to others. Reality for some people is not reality for others. What is normal to Christians is not normal to lost people, is it? I remember, I remember a few years back, our family, my family, we took a road trip up north. And we, we, I can vividly remember one day on that trip the contrast of the normalcies on that day in particular. On one of our days, we went through Quaker country in Pennsylvania, and just a few hours later, we found ourselves in Manhattan in New York. And you talk about two totally different places and two totally different forms of normal all in the same day. But to the people that live in those particular places, both were normal to them. They think their lives are normal and they're right. So whatever we're used to becomes normal for us, even if those from the outside look in and think that we're completely nuts when we do it, right? So that, that's reality. And, and there are some realities when you begin to think about these scriptures and what becomes normal to us and how we prioritize our time and whether or not we are thankful. And I was thinking on that a lot this week, and these are just, this is just the truth. These are just realities, and we'll, we'll go with these for just a second. Here's some realities. One, our lifestyles have become normal to us. The, the, our lifestyles become normal to us. I don't care who you are, however you're living now, it's, your version of you has become normal for you. The danger is, is that some of what has become normal to us is actually off track if we take a step back and we look at things biblically. So today, I, my goal is that I want to look at the Bible and see that sometimes we have to, what we accept as normal is not normal according to God, if that makes sense. Here's something else that I know about us. Here's the second thing. We are way too preoccupied. We are way too preoccupied. We're, we're way too busy. We're way too pulled in different directions whatever, ever, how we want to phrase that. Distraction has become normal for us. If someone asks you, how are you doing? What is the common response these days? Man, I'm busy, right? Everybody's busy. Guy can be standing there doing nothing, and he's busy, right? Has, you know, nothing to do, and, he, and he's busy. Pulled a million different directions. It's become the new normal for us. We're a busy society, in a hurry to, there, there's a great theologian, Randy Owens, the group Alabama said, I'm in a hurry to get things done. I rush and rush until life's no fun, right? I mean, it's just, it's the reality. We're, we're in a society that is always in a rush, even, even in our area. We're not in a, in a big city, but people, I mean, you just drive through Coleman at 12 noon any day of the week, and man, get, get out of the way. It's a traffic jam. It's like people, like where, where are people trying to go? to you know you be just a little late pulling out after the red light turns to green and guy in the chevy chevy spectrum is blowing his horn like he's he's like i got to get the dollar general man and they're like you got you better get out of the way more than four in ten christians around the world say that they are often or always in a rush from task to task about six in ten christians say 
that it's often or always true that the busyness of life gets in the way of them having a growing relationship with God. That's, that's the place between, uh, between hard work, which is actually what we're going to talk about next week, work and the gospel, and the opposite of that, which the Scripture says is wrong too, of being lazy. There's, there's somewhere in the middle that we have to hit this the right way and see what Scripture says. Y'all going to think I'm crazy this morning. I read a survey that said pastors are the busiest profession on the planet. The people that are pulling the most directions than any other. So all these jokes about, well, you only work for two hours on Sunday and one on Wednesday night. They got to stop, right? <laughs> it's just got to stop. I mean, that's, that's what the survey says. We're the busiest people around. Here's one to chew on this morning. Think about this. Are our kids being taught to be busy but not godly? Our busyness communicates to our children that our lives are about being productive and efficient, and this crowds out any sort of larger story about what life is really all about, like faith in Christ and eternity. One more thing I know about us before we look deeper into the Scripture is this. Here's the third thing. It takes no effort to waste our time. I've learned that the hard way sometimes. It takes no effort to waste time. It happens automatically. That means that unless you take purposeful, direct action, you'll, you'll always default toward wasting time. And when I talk about wasting time, I think the things that kind of come to our minds first are watching TV shows that we don't even like, playing endless video games, or being on social media and turn around and it's an hour later and where did that time go? I mean, the list goes on. It's, it's different for different people and what we spend our time doing. But I'm really talking more about prioritizing and making sure that the time that we do have is meaningfully used, purpose with our time. Eugene Peterson labeled over-busyness as a form of laziness, and I think he's right. He said the reason is that it will take absolutely no effort on your part to get busy and remain busy. That's the, actually the lazy option. You'll have to work very hard to prioritize. That will take incredible work. It's not the lazy way at all. Your busyness is actually a form of laziness, and chances are it's keeping you from investing your life meaningfully. It's also quite possibly damaging your children's lives, and yet it has become normal for us. That's what he said. It's a problem that we need to address, and I think that's where my heart's been this week. Paul gives us some real help here in Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16 about prioritizing and making sure that we're living a life of thankfulness, a life of wisdom, a life that, that shows that we are focused on Jesus Christ. So again, Ephesians 5, 15, and 16, let's look at it one more time. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. One version of this renders it a little bit better, a little closer to the original language for us to understand what it means when it begins by saying how you walk. Look carefully then how you walk. If you get closer to that original language, it actually means be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. And the Bible talks about that a lot, especially Proverbs says that there are two ways that you can live your life. You can live your life purposely, or you can live it foolishly. You can live your life eternally with an eternal perspective, or you can live temporarily. I think Paul got this. I think he understood this. Paul was a guy who could look back on his life from before he was saved. He could look back on his life and see all the time that had been wasted, all the time that didn't go for God. And he was thankful. This was a man who was thankful that he had been saved. And he might say to a lot of us as we are living our lives unwisely or foolishly at times, He's saying to us, you know, there's an option. You don't have to do that. We can choose to live wisely, but it's going to take some deliberate action on our part as believers. The, the old King James version of this verse at the beginning of verse 15 says, it actually says it like this. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly. See then that you walk circumspectly. Now, that's, that's not a word we use very often. We don't use that word circumspectly very much. The best picture I could use to describe that word circumspectly, it's the best thing I could think of would be maybe like if I was walking on a roof. Now, some of you might be pretty good at that, but I don't like heights, and so if I ever have to get on a roof, which is not very often, I've only done it a couple, two or three times, but if I've ever got to get on a roof, man, I walk circumspectly. 
I walk circumspectly. I, in other words, I'm very careful. Another good example, for some reason, my dog likes to hang out on top of our retaining wall. I don't know why she does that, but that's what she does. She will, about 9 o'clock every night, she gets up on the retaining wall and she barks at the rest of the neighborhood until we have to put her up. But I've noticed when I see her out on that wall, I turn the floodlight on, I see her on the wall, as she begins to come down, she doesn't just leap off the wall, she walks circumspectly back down to the end of the retaining wall, and, she, and then she hops off. Every step we take is purposeful, carefully chosen. It should be like that, just like each step on the roof. The next thing, I think, would be to ask a question, well then, okay, if we're supposed to walk circumspectly, be careful about how we live, then how do we live carefully and how do we walk circumspectly? One way is what Paul tells us in verse 16. He says, by making the best use of our time. One version words it like this, and I think it's, it's, it's a better rendering, making the most of every opportunity. That we would make the most of every opportunity. And he, he tells us why. The, the question then is asked why, and he said, because the days are evil. In other words, as believers, we can't just haphazardly walk out, out into our world and just live life and skip around happy, happy Christians and act like nothing ever really happens. The days are evil. We must be very intentional. There are a couple of things that I think we need to understand about what Paul says here. The first is what he means by this phrase, the best use of our time or making the most of every opportunity. He uses a very intentional word in the original language in the Greek. It's the word kairos, K-I-R-O-S, and that's the word for opportunity. Paul is showing us something that sometimes we forget or maybe we didn't even really realize to start with. And that's that not all time is equal. There are particular moments that are especially significant or favorable in our lives. And, and if we think about it, we know what that's like. Have you, maybe you've had a conversation before. Have you ever had a conversation with someone in which there was just this moment that a truth was birthed? A, for lack of a better term, a, a pregnant moment. A moment in which you could say something that make, could make a real difference in a person's life. A moment which what was birthed out of your mouth is something that would make all the difference in the world. And you, and you realize that was a kairos moment. That was a moment that really meant something. And I've had times when I missed those moments, the, those times when I could have had a huge impact, but maybe I, I didn't, or maybe I froze, or didn't say the thing I should have said. Have you ever been there, and you're driving down the road later, and you think back and you say, if I, could, if I had that to do over again, or if I could have that conversation again, I would have said this, or I would have done this, if I could, if I could, ever been there, if I could go back and do that all again, maybe it's big things in life, maybe it's some of the stuff we've been talking about before, maybe it's in parenting, or in marriage, or this or that, if I could go back, I would, if I knew, if I knew then what I know now, and if I could go back, I would do it differently, and Paul says that we have to be wise enough to take advantage of those Cairo moments that come up in life, and be ready to to seize those opportunities. It's interesting what Paul says, making the most of every opportunity. The, the word picture of making the most of our opportunities is kind of interesting. As he uses this, it's this thought of buying back those Cairo moments. It's, it's something that we should understand in, in, in a world that is full of investments. We, we would kind of phrase it this way, every Everybody has those Kairos moments happen to them, and everyone has a choice in how they invest in those Cairo moments and how they use their resources and what God's given them to invest in those moments when they come. Let me give you another example. Let's, let's say you spend your life investing your time in things that maybe seem important to you, but they're not the Kairos things. And imagine that you do that consistently, and then imagine 10 years from now you realize that you have invested in some stuff and in some things, but maybe they're worldly things, but you missed out on things that were kairos moments, those times at home maybe with your spouse or your kids or in relationships and friendships that you should have invested in important things. 
those moments that you could have spent with your kids or your spouse, and they passed you by. And it happens to people all the time. People all the time turn around, and, and 10 years later, they realize the things they missed out on. And that's why Paul says we need to recognize the kairos moments when we have them and arrange our lives to invest in those things when they come up. Because here's the bottom line. We don't ever get those times back. Two questions I think we ought to ask. This is simply from your pastor's heart this week. Number one, here's the first question. Where are the Kairos moments in your life showing up right now? Where, where are those Kairos moments? I don't think there are many more important questions that we could answer. Where are those moments of potential deep impact where you could make a tremendous difference? And maybe you sit here this morning and realize you're not right now, but you need to. A difference in someone's life. And you don't need to let those moments pass you by. Those moments you will never be able to get back. I, I can tell you that if you have children at home, Kairos moments happen all the time, and you'll turn around and blink, and then they're grown up, right? The problem is, is that we don't see these Kairos moments and how they evaporate so quickly in real time sometimes when they're happening. And that one day we're going to turn around, and those are going to turn into Kronos moments, chronological, like, oh, I, you know, my kid's not eight anymore, they're grown, or whatever it may be. If you're younger, maybe you're sitting in here this morning, you're a student, and, I, and, and you say, well, you know, I, I don't see that right now. You're getting Kairos moments right now. And you're like, well, where am I getting Kairos moments? You're getting them at school. You're, you're getting them in, in, in those times when you think, you know, why have I got to study this? How's this ever going to help me? Right? That happens. And uh, friendships and, pe and people that God's putting in your life. Maybe you're a senior adult and you're like, I've had so many Kairos moments, I can't even remember them, right? And, and, I, and I, you still have them too. They're all kind of Kairos moments. In fact, you probably have a unique place where you've learned a lot from those, from those moments that you've done well and some that you've missed before. And you have a lot of wisdom and you can speak into a lot of younger people's lives with wisdom and experience. So... No matter what your age, I tell you that those Kairos moments are there and we don't need to miss them. What it kept coming back to my heart this week, and this is really the core of this whole thing, was really what Paul said in a different place, and we'll preach on this. Uh, <laughs> it may be a few months down the road, but 2 Corinthians chapter 6, when we get into Corinthians, here's what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. He told the church at Corinth, he said, Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. This opportunity to respond to God's grace in these Kairos moments. We could all take a lesson from that. So that's the first question. Where are the Kairos moments in your life? Because if you don't recognize and identify them, they're going to be gone and you're not ever going to get them back. The second thing, the second question is this. What are you investing in right now that's causing you to miss those moments? In other words, what's taking the place of that? What, what are you too busy with right now? Where, you can't, where, where you're in the forest and you can't see the trees. Well, most of life is, is ordinary time, I think, and how we're spending our life, are we making those into those right kind of moments? And don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. I'm, I'm not in any way saying that it, it would go against what we're going to preach next week. I mean, hard work is an important thing. There's nothing wrong with making money or education or any of those kind of things. But we need to ask ourselves if those things are causing us to miss out on the strategic, listen to me, the strategic times that God has for us, then maybe that's a problem. There's, there's nothing wrong with watching a movie if it's a good one or playing a game or whatever it may be. I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of that, but is it causing us just to float through life and miss what God has for us? Listen to me close on this one. We've kind of said this before, and I, I just feel like maybe we should say it again. There's nothing wrong with having our kids involved in things. But if they're missing what's most important, and we're just involved in stuff, then we need to make some changes, don't we? Those Kairos moments will never get back. There's nothing wrong with discussing politics or sports or whatever it may be. God doesn't want us to be idle. God doesn't want us to hide away from the world and never impact the world? But are we, are we involved in those things that really matter? Are we discussing with our families the things that really matter? Paul concludes this verse with kind of an 
odd explanation of why this is so important. It's good, you know, it's good to say all this, but why is it so important? Why would we take a Sunday to preach on it? And his simple answer was because the days are evil. It's kind of interesting that that's what he says. He says because the days are evil. That was his reason. He saw it. He, Paul, I think, probably better than anybody else, obviously because God used him to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to pen a lot of the Scripture that we read in the New Testament. I guess he saw it. He, he saw the, the great dupe that the world pulls over on Christians. We, the reality is, is that we do live in an evil age. We do live in an age where it's hard for people to know the right thing to do. And it's because of this that we have to, as believers, we have to live deliberately. We have to do what Paul says. We have to walk carefully. We have to be wise instead of unwise. There's a realization in life called the law of entropy. The, the law of entropy is that left to themselves, things will break down. Does that kind of make sense? In other words, if a car sits and is not used, it's going to break down. When a house sits and it's not used, things begin to break down. When you don't exercise and take care of yourself and take care of your body, the, the body begins to break down. And because, and think about it like this, because there's pride and wickedness and all kind of sin and evil in this world, things break down over time if we don't take advantage of the Kairos moments and be the people we're supposed to be as Christians. Paul is saying, in other words, you can't just sit around and let it all happen. You have to be actively growing in your faith as a believer. You and I, we have the good news. We have the most important, the best thing in life. If we understand the grace of Jesus Christ, if we're saved this morning, if we're Christians, then we know what God has done for us. And we know that by our choices each day as Christians, we can live our days differently. God gives us kairos moments every day that we can grab a hold of and make a huge impact or we can let them go by. And, and the question would be this morning for me and for you, what's keeping us from redeeming those? What's keeping us from redeeming those i was i was at office max a few a few days ago picking up some stuff from the church and she said would you like to redeem your cash rewards and i was like yeah yeah i would i didn't know i had any and she was like oh you got a dollar 47 and i was like well okay i mean that'll make that 192.47 instead of 194 so i mean that's great but I didn't know I had them, and I think sometimes we're walking through life and we don't realize that we've got, you know, we've got the reward of Christ in our hearts. It's better than $1.47 at Office Max, I can tell you that. D.T. Nile said, hurry means that we gather impressions, but we have no experiences. We collect acquaintances, but we make no friends. That we attend meetings, but we experience no encounters. We must recover eternity in order to find time, and eternity is what Jesus came to restore. And we hear all this today, and you may say, well, you know, good sermon today, Murph. I, we, you know, we need to hear that. Why did you preach it? Well, here, here's why. Because I was, just to be honest, I was thinking about thankfulness a lot this week. And maybe you were too. I, I really believe that our thankfulness, listen to me, I think our thankfulness drives the way we spend our time. I believe that. I, I believe that it helps us make priorities. I think the more we're thankful for what Christ has done, the more it impacts and changes how we live. Billy Graham was asked what he was most surprised by in life. Billy Graham. And you know what he said? When Billy Graham was asked at the age of 90 what he was most surprised by in life, he said, it's brevity. He was 90. And he said he was surprised by the brevity of life. He was an old man, and he, he said that. I, I think the natural tendency is the older you get, the more you think about using your time wisely in light of eternity. You begin to learn to try to evaluate what really matters in life. I, I kept thinking of Moses this week. Moses must have been feeling this when he wrote Psalm, uh, you know, when we see Psalm chapter 90. He had spent his first 40 years as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. He lived, uh, lived in, a, in the comfort of a palace. He spent his next 40 years as a fugitive shepherd wandering around the Sinai Peninsula. 
He spent the last 40 years of his long life, his life of 120 years, leading a rebellious bunch of, of, of Jewish people, Israelis, out of slavery in Egypt, but would never quite make it to the promised land. They were camped somewhere in the wilderness, shy of that goal, never having made it to the promised land. And Moses wrote Psalm chapter 90, reflecting on the brevity of life. Again, I mean, even more so than Billy Graham. In Psalm 90, verse 12, look at this. It says, so here's what he said. He says, so teach us to number our days that we may present to you, being the Lord, a heart of wisdom. He concluded that psalm in verse 17. He said, Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of your hands. Yes, confirm the work of your hands. That we would walk wisely, not as unwise. Maybe that's what we should talk about as we kind of put this together. How to walk wisely, but not as unwise. To not be too busy to be thankful, but to walk in the wise way. I think that there's a couple of things that we got to understand, and here it is. And we'll, Let me just kind of bring this together. You must know what God wants you to be and how to get there. As believers, again, we can't just be haphazard. Like we, need to, we need to know more scripturally and biblically, and we need to know what God wants us to be, and we need to know how to get there. And God's Word tells us. So what does God want us to be? I can promise you this. Number one, God wants you to please and glorify Him with your life. If you don't want to waste time, but you want to make the most of these days, God wants you to please and glorify Him with your life. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all of the glory of God. The Westminster Catechism says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's what we're here for. To glorify God in simple terms means to... to Worship Him for who He truly is. To extol and magnify and exalt His person and attributes through praise, honor, thanksgiving, trust, and obedience. Secondly, I can promise you this. God wants you to know Him more deeply. You can only magnify and glorify God to the extent to which you really know Him as He is revealed in His Word. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that our chief problem as believers is that we do not know God as deeply as we ought. Paul said that he counted everything else. This is what Paul said in Scripture in Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. He said he counted everything else in life as loss and rubbish in order that he may know Christ more fully. The only way that we can know him as he is, revealed is how he has revealed himself in his word. So as we read the Bible, as you read the Bible, ask God to open your eyes that you may know him more deeply. Be like Moses was in Exodus 33, 18, when he prayed, Lord, show me your glory. Third, God wants you to be a godly person. You can only glorify God to the extent that you display his holiness through your obedience. You're not saved by your obedience, but you, if you are saved, we're to be growing in obedience. 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 through 16 puts it like this. Peter said, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Jesus said that in, 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 Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, he said, blessed are those, listen to this, who hunger and who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Fourth. God wants you to proclaim him by your life and your words. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may, pro may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Ephesians 5.8, You were formerly darkness, but now you're light, and the Lord walk as children of the light. Okay, good stuff, but how do we get there? How do we, how do we get there? I mean, there's, there's a, lot, a lot more things, I think, that could be said, but I think in general, number one, you must discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. 1 Timothy 4.7 is a great example. I would, I would say in all my years of ministry that the presence or absence of self-discipline 
is one of the most determining factors of whether a person is going to have serious problems in their Christian life or whether or not they're going to be a growing believer. I was so convicted about that. That's, that's what I did my dissertation on when I did my doctorate, was on spiritual disciplines and how, and starting with myself, but how we as the church are not as disciplined in the spiritual disciplines as we should be. Psalm 1 pictures it that the godly person meditates on God's word day and night. Like a tree planted by a river, the scripture says. The second thing is that we must learn to think biblically about life. Have a biblical worldview. Walking wisely doesn't mean that you just think, but you think like God thinks. You think the things of God, what God says. Every moral issue is, is, we're, we're driven to think about those things in the way that God thinks about them, in the way God views them. So when it comes down to it, I think, we have to realize that his, his wisdom is in the, in the word and he gives it to us. We can't let it pass us by. And only God gives us eternity and we got to think with an eternal perspective. I don't know about you, can you? I, I can't fathom eternity. I read an explanation of eternity once. You may have heard it before that if a sparrow flew to the Atlantic Ocean and filled his beak with water and then flew all the way across the United States to the Pacific Ocean, then he emptied his beak, and then he rested for a thousand years, and then he flew back to the Atlantic and filled his beak again and flew to the Pacific, emptied his beak, and continued this process until the entire Atlantic was emptied into the Pacific Ocean, resting a thousand years between each trip, and then put all the water back after he had done that. After he was done, not one day of eternity would have passed. I can't even begin to imagine it. Can't fathom it. But here's the bottom line. I'm thankful I get to be there with my Savior. That's what I thought about this week. Are you thankful for that? Does it drive how you live now? How we live impacts eternity. He's given us wisdom in the word. I hope we can, I hope we can slow down and listen. I hope we can be thankful for what Christ has, for what Christ has done. I'm going to back up and punt. Our worship man may get mad at me this morning, but I'm going to back up and punt. I asked the guys to load a video for us. Haley, you going to be mad at me? Okay, she's not mad at me. Okay, good. Listen, listen. All I can think about, some of you may have seen this before. Now, I just want to, we'll close with this and then we'll pray. But when I think about thankfulness and how I want to spend my time, it's all driven by this. It's driven by by the grace of Christ and the salvation that he has afforded me and afforded you. If you're a Christian, I want you just to watch this. This is a little short clip. It's about, it's about two minutes from Alistair Begg. Some of you have seen it, I know, but it's, it's, the, it's called The Man on the Middle Cross. And it's just a reminder of what Christ did for us. So as we pull out of Thanksgiving, we head toward Christmas, think about what Christ has done for us. Think about whether we're thankful, how we live in our days. If you don't know Christ, this is the great invite. We want to invite you to know, to know him.